So um, I am talking still, we are talking still about repentance, and uh, we're going to finish this out, I hope. Longing, zeal, and punishment are the last three things on the list of repentance. And the way that we're forming this lesson, we go through right now. Yeah, here we go. So the way we're forming this is we found in 2 Corinthians 7 a record of what Paul said to the church at Corinth after the first letter. How that, you know, and if you read the first letter, you will see very plainly that that is a crazy place and uh, not the kind of place where you would want to be a member, um, I dare say, looking at all the things that were amiss. But uh, the way that Paul dealt with that was to say that that was wrong and to give the reasons for it in the scriptures, and they repented of that. Uh, which seems like a novel concept today, but actually that's how it's supposed to be. You teach the Bible and people repent and do what God asks them to do. That's how it's supposed to go. Um, on their repentance, we read these words of Paul, how that they get to a point of proving themselves innocent in the matter. And that's the point that we want to be at. How do we prove ourselves innocent in a matter of sin after the fact? And that's the repentance. You read in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And uh, we've said before, we will say again. I think a great example of this is the response of Judas and the response of Peter to having betrayed our Lord to his death. Judas's response was worldly grief. He regretted that this had happened. He uh, despaired of life because of this happened, and he allowed that pain to consume him and took his own life. That was worldly grief. It led to death. Peter also was very sad that this had happened, and you see the exchange between him and the Lord at the end of the Gospel of John, where uh, it's not terribly clear in the original, but what's happening is the Lord saying to him, are you ready to sacrifice for me yet? And Peter is saying, no, no, I'm not. There's different words for love used there. The first time he's saying, do you have the sacrificial love for me, the agape love? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you, but what he says there is the friendship love, the phil phile, like Philadelphia. Only not like Philadelphia, I actually love your brother. Um, and so he's saying, you know, you're ready to sacrifice. And he's saying, no, I'm still just a friend. I'm not good enough to sacrifice. That's what they're saying. And he asks him again. But the third time, he used the same word for love that Peter used. So oh, you're just a friend, are you? what that means. And that's why Peter was upset, not because he asked him three times in a row, which apparently is not annoying to the ancients like it would be to us, but he rather was upset because it sounded like, oh, you're not going to sacrifice after all. Is that right? And that's a terrible thing. Nonetheless, we do know that Peter did repent. And even though he was sorry, and even though he grieved, and even though he regretted what he had done, he did do better. He did repent he made things right. He gave his life. He became what we know about him in the rest of the New Testament and in his letters. Especially his second letter, where you see a very mature elder of the church. It's good. That's the difference between godly grief and worldly grief. Now you see what this earnest or what earnestness the godly grief has produced in you. But also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. The godly grief that led them to the place of you are innocent by means of repentance was defined for us here. This is the thing that I realized only recently. This is a definition there are attributes of uh, there are attributes of repentance according to this passage, and these are they. 
Now we've already talked about these others and those are available on uh, YouTube, for example, or SoundCloud, uh, which I recommend because I've got a face for radio. But do whatever works for you. Attributes of repentance, though, include longing, zeal, and punishment. That's where we are today, uh, looking at these final things. But a final note in summary, this is what you're looking for in repentance. People come sometimes um, and they want to know, you know, well, uh, I've heard this thing happened in the past and I don't know where that stands now. Well, um, ask for these things. When you ask somebody about this thing, if that person is repentant, and if that person is merely worldly grieved, will become evident based on the display or lack thereof of these attributes. If you say, well, I am told that you held um, the hands of a denominational uh, religious group and join hands with them in teaching marriage uh, relationship classes uh, in which it was forbidden to condemn homosexuality. And if the response to that, uh, which they did do, by the way, that's legitimately, that actually happened here. Uh, not at this church. Um, but if the response to that is, well, you know, that was a long time ago. And, you know, those people, the people have changed, you know, th those people are not around anymore. Hmm. Which of these is that? Earnestness? No, no. Fear? Mm, no, they don't seem afraid. Zeal? Longing? Punishment? No, no, I wouldn't say so. Which of the, um, you know, that happened a long time ago, nobody cares anymore. Where does that fall under repentance? Is that earnest? And what is the statute of limitations on sin? When does God just pretend like it didn't happen and it doesn't matter? And it's okay. Uh, right. That doesn't fit very well into this Bible verse, does it? So that's the thing. You need to be looking for eagerness to clear yourself. What if that had been this congregation? What would you say? You would say, wouldn't you? Yes, that did happen. That's a truthful report. I am ashamed to say. That was a sin. We did wrong in that, and we have repented. There were some who did not repent. They were withdrawn from. Right? That's what you do, isn't it? Because you're earnest. You're eager to clear yourself. There's a, an appropriate indignation over what was done. There's a fear of God in the place, not fear of man. A longing for things to be made right, the record to be set straight, right? A seal, and again, an appropriate punishment. The, the, the actions bespeak the repentance. That is a place where, okay, yeah, there was a thing that happened and that's bad, but they're repentant. Now you put that away and you don't bring that up because they're repentant. But there's a difference. So let's talk about longing. And we'll start at Philippians 4. In Romans 15, but as we've done here, we're looking together at the Greek dictionary first for longing, which is a word that means longing after a desire in addition to. So the epi at the front of this, if you read Greek, um, is that upon or on top of. It's not just the desire, um, but it's besides or even more, which means it's, you know, it's a more uh, intense feeling, which we might say yearning or feeling that that's missing somehow. What is it that we would yearn for or what is it that we would feel is missing that we really desire? And so I go back to the beginnings of the New Testament, James and uh, First Peter, the first letters to be written. James 4, 5 says, do you suppose it is to no purpose? That the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. This is right after having said, adulteresses, don't you know? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. God is jealous over us. The spirit that we have that belongs to him, 
he uh, yearns for that. He longs for that. He loves us. He wants us to be faithful to him. And in 1 Peter, for our part, we are told to grow, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, the same way that the newborn baby grows. Long for the pure spiritual milk, which is the milk of the word, actually, that by it you may grow up into salvation. The spiritual milk, the milk of the word. The newborn infant. Does the newborn infant long for the milk? Well, if you've ever had a newborn infant, you know the answer to this. <laughs> it's fairly clear. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. We used to talk about one of the children had a contract, which is very clear. I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> it's a very simple contract, you know. Uh, I think he forged my signature on that. I don't remember. But um, the newborn infant longs for the milk. It's true. And, you know, the mother's milk is a different lesson, but a really great one, um, which is somewhat informed by modern scientific discoveries, that actually the content of mother's milk changes every day, and it changes between feedings. So that what is appropriate for the child to receive, the high fats and things, are uh, especially present in the early morning hours. But in the evening, it's a different makeup. And that is a fascinating thing when you think about how the Word of God works as you grow, with the Lord providing for you exactly what you need at the time that you need it. It's pretty cool. I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, but moving on, Philippians 4 um, Let's use the scriptures still to define this. These are remote scriptures. We were, in, we were talking about 2 Corinthians, but these are other places where the same idea is used. Philippians 4.1, My brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. And this is the letter um, where people talk about epistolography, where they uh, study the writing of letters, the form and format of letters. And I remember doing this as a kid. They used to tell us about business letters and informal letters and things. And I don't think that's part of the curriculum anymore. Nobody writes letters to them. But um, in those classes, they talk about the order of events in a letter, how you start with, um, you know, uh, who are you? Who are they? What is good? And then what needs to be addressed? And Philippians is famous for getting, you know, all the way to the final verses before anything is asked for. <laughs> Which means Philippi is doing great. As opposed to, say, 1 Corinthians. <laughs> Which is like, well, you're Christians at least. Now, we need to talk about some things. <laughs> it's, it's kind of severe. Um, so to get all the way to 4.1, therefore... When he says, I long for you, you're my joy, my crown. You know, this is a faithful congregation, and he's really encouraged by them. That's what we mean. Longing for them, you could see that in all the various places that he was found during that time. Romans 15, though, he speaks of longing to go to Rome. I've longed for many years to come to you at Rome. I hope to see you in passing on my way to Spain. And to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. If he wants to spend time in Rome, I think he's going to end up spending more time than he wanted to in Rome, but that's how it is. I don't think he made it to Spain. But it's clear what he means by this. They have been thinking that he's avoiding going there, but that's not true, actually. They're, he's been called to different things at different times. But he does long for them. He wants to see them. Now, in the, uh, in the letter from which we drew the context of the, of the study, 2 Corinthians, we have this word use in other places, chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, and also verse 4. We know if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If, or in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. While we're still in this tent, we groan being burdened, 
not that we want to be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And this is the truth, you know, uh, the, the world um, can be a difficult place, and there is pain, there is suffering, there is sickness and dying, there, there, there's injustice, there's corruption, there's so many things. And it's true, we do long to be swallowed up by life, not that we want to be unclothed, not that we wish for it all to end and to be destroyed. That, that would be the wrong kind of grief. Um, we're saying we want to be further clothed. We crave that life that, um, that overpowers the darkness that is in the world. And that's true. There's a longing for that, a desire to find a place of peace, a, a, a place of uh, rest. And in the ninth chapter, 13 and 14, he speaks to them of giving money for the support of the saints in Judea who are facing a famine. All the way from Greece, they're going to send money across the Mediterranean. Yes. He writes to them about other people giving, saying their approval of this charitable contribution uh, means they glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. What they mean by this is Judea approving the contribution, meaning accepting, okay, we will accept charitable uh, giving from the congregations that are not in Judea. They in Judea will be glorifying God because the church at Corinth in Greece has obeyed the gospel. There are Christians in Greece now. It's not just a Judean thing anymore. Because of that, they, you know, they glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. And they glorify God because of the generosity of your contribution for them and all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. So this church obeyed the gospel. They haven't met any of these people in Judea, but they know that they owe their lives to them. So they're going to send support to them in their time of physical need. It's a small thing if they reap a physical benefit from somebody who saved their lives, their souls. So they long for you and they pray for you. The, the church of Judea desires to know something more about the Greeks who have obeyed the gospel. You know, um, uh, we, we probably have a tendency to think of Judea as a rough spot for Christians in the first century. But, you know, Greece had to be a lot worse. That had to be a really hard place to be a Christian. And uh, we can talk about it later, but understand, you know, Judea is relatively friendly to the gospel of Jesus. It was, it was you know, that's the whole point of that nation. <laughs> uh, Greece is really unfriendly, pretty hard to live there. Let's talk about zeal. And speaking of zeal, I might have been overzealous thinking we could get them all done. I don't think we can. <laughs> but let's try. Zeal. We have two spots to go to. 2 Corinthians and James uh, chapter 3. But first we stop in the lexicon. Zeal. Which is the Greek zealos, which uh, tells you that they chose not to translate that word. Like baptismos. What does baptismos mean? Oh, it means baptism. Oh, okay. Right. Eh. But what does it really mean? Well, it means dunking in water. Well, why did you say that? Well, because we can't sell this Bible if we do that. <laughs> All right. Jealousy is what zeal, but really it's like not just jealousy. It's like rivalry. You have an awareness of the other, and, and uh, you want to be like them. You, you care about them. You, um, you know, you're, you're encouraged. Maybe we would call it the spree de corps. Um, this is the idea for zeal. Somebody is really encouraged for God. They're... They want to rise to the occasion. They want to be like those of faith who came before. 
It also means pride, honor, or glory, uh, as well as your attitude or spirit, which comes to be in your tastes or your interests. <laughs> what is it that gets you going? What do you want to do? What do you want to know? You know, this is one of the things that I think is evident in our attendance habits and in our study habits is, well, what is your taste? What is your interest? Where do you spend your time? And where should you? There are a lot of things that have no should in life, but that one has a should. Well, let's compare 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, which is com comparable in that it's a, it's a use of the word in the same way. I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion in Christ. It was interesting to me that the divine jealousy here is... Uh, over the over us who are supposed to be uh, devoted to him, faithful to him, and that we could be led astray from him. It's interesting to me that that marriage relationship, that fidelity in marriage, is the same thing that we read about in James four that he called them adulteresses because the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride. Uh, I know. Uh, some of the translations in James 4 uh, change it to adulterers and adulteresses because they think it's, I don't know, they think it's egalitarian or they think there's something about the way that we handle gender in plural uh, nouns, etc. But that's, they've missed it. The point is that the church is the bride of Christ. That's why it says adulteresses. It's not because they don't like women. Here, we as the church are betrothed to one husband. It's the same idea, that uh, concern that we have for the other, the love we have for the other. And Paul says, I feel this divine jealousy because, you know, I'm afraid that you're going to be walking away from this. That's his fear. On the other hand, we have James 3, um, where zeal becomes selfish ambition, and bitter jealousy. Boasting. In James 3, 13 to 16, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. Now, don't, don't lie. That's not coming from God. This isn't the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice too. This jealousy, this bitter jealousy, self-seeking, selfish ambition in the heart, this is not wisdom. This is not the conduct that demonstrates by works the meekness of wisdom. This leads to something very different. The self-seeking, the boasting, the uh, false claims of being the truth, but it's not the truth. It's demonic. In fact, it's unspiritual, it's earthly. That's true. When we substitute the uh, mores of man, the thinking of man for the teaching of God, that's evil, that's demonic. Um, when we say that the Bible cannot be understood, that's evil, that's demonic. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you wanna say that it can't be understood, I mean, doesn't that mean that God didn't write it? Because who made the mind? Who made the mouth? Who made the tongue? Well, God did these things. Who created language? God did these things. Why can't he get us a Bible that we can understand? It doesn't make sense. That's demonic. That's earthly. There will be disorder in every vile practice. It's true. Maybe we will finish because we move on to punishment. The punishment phase of this lesson. <laughs> Uh, lexicon entry for punishment. Um, this is uh, meeting out justice. Ek being out and DK is uh, your justice, your, your court. So the order of the court is carried out. Avenging, giving satisfaction, you know, you know effecting the legal remedy, um, punishing, exacting the vengeance, or just plain handing down the verdict, you know, deciding the case. But it's also personal. You maybe are doing this on behalf of some other person who um, 
you know, whose goods you are recovering on behalf of the court or taking up his cause. Maybe you're his attorney or, um, you know, punishing another person who has wronged them. But that's punishment. Now, we don't mean by this that we take our own vengeance. What do we mean by this? Well, the idea, I think, between the lines here is that giving satisfaction, giving legal remedy, um, a decision in a case, a cause taken up, what we mean by this is that it has been worked out. At this, the, the, when the verdict comes down, it is worked out. This is solved. Here's how it's going to be. So when we're repentant, that's where we're going. When it comes to punishment, we have, for example, Luke 18, verse 1, he told them a parable to the effect that they ought not lose heart, but always to pray. And the parable was about a widow you know, nagging a judge to death. He says, I'm not afraid of God, I'm not afraid of man, but she's going to kill me. I'm just going to give her what she wants. <laughs> he said, won't God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he de delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. There will be an answer, right? When we talk of this punishment, you know, sin is, well, sinful. <laughs> sin is wrong. Something is wrong. Something has been done that harms people. And there is harm evident in this thing, and therefore something has to be done to make things right. Whatever that thing might be, and maybe there's not anything you could do, but to the best of your ability, if you stole a watch, you have to give the watch back. If you don't have it anymore, you have to try to pay for it. And that's, that's giving the justice, if you will, that's paying it back. The Lord does not delay long. He listens and he gives that justice. If we are repentant, we are making things right. We are going back and undoing as much of the harm as, as we can. That's repentant. A person who's going back and making corrections. Uh, we see in Acts 7 that Moses did this in Israel when he saw one of the children of Israel being wronged by an Egyptian, he defended that oppressed man and avenged him, striking down the Egyptian. That, that avenging there, he defended the man and even had, you know, it ended up in a very bad way here. But the point was that this was an oppressed person who was being defended from an unjust authority and that's the kind of punishment we're talking about. When we're repentant, <coughs> we're championing, championing the cause um, of the lowly, the cause of the oppressed, the, the widow and the orphan, the foreigner within your gates. These are the things that you do in repentance. In Romans 12, it says in the 17th down through the 21st verse, repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. It is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Right, we're not saying that, that Christians take vengeance or that Christians exact vengeance from other people. You remember the parable of uh, the man who owed his master lifetime's worth of wages and begged him have mercy with me have patience with me and i'll repay all and the master forgave him the debt you remember this parable the man went out and grabbed his fellow servant by the throat who owed him a few days wages and said pay what you owe and would not let him go so that's the place where the servant said well but i have to pay the master back see I'm afraid that we think that way sometimes. You can't exact it from your brethren. You can't pay for your sins. You'll never pay the Lord back. You can't extract it from people around you. It doesn't work that way. The master will be very angry with you if you do that. On the contrary, if the enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he's thirsty, you give him a drink. In so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. But we don't actually seek the destruction of our enemies. The Lord said, pray for your enemies. What he means by this is you kill them with kindness. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Confucius was uh, is uh, famously quoted as rejecting the Lord's teaching, um, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, or uh, do good to those who hate you. He said, well, then uh, how do we repay evil then? Or how do we repay good? And uh, he just doesn't understand that um, it's not a two-way transaction. The Lord is the accountant. <laughs> the burning coals is your um, credit with God, not that you seek another's destruction. Their destruction is not nearly the credit to you that their salvation would be. If you can forgive, if you can leave that in the past, if that person can learn in you an inkling of the mercy and forgiveness that God has, and they obey the gospel, who knows what they can do and what we can do together. And that's a much better outcome than you getting justice in this world. Second Thessalonians 1, uh, 6 through 8, we speak also of vengeance here. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who now afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. No, ignorance is not an excuse. But he's contrasting the outcome. For those who are faithful, he will give us relief. For those who do not know him, those who have not obeyed him, there will be vengeance. Justice will be meted out. And Hebrews 10, 28 down through 31, we have anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. True. How much worse a punishment do you think is deserved by someone who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Probably worse. A lot worse. Has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, has outraged the spirit of grace. Well, who's done this? Well, the Christian who's fallen away. The Christian who falls away is doing this. When we sin, we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. We say, oh, he's going to judge the world. Yes, that's true, but he's going to start with us. We're first. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. True, we must give an answer for what we have done, and we need to approach it that way. And there's a difference between repentance and regret. There's a difference between really wanting God to be happy with you and to have cleared your name completely of this thing and just wanting people to accept you. Those are really different. Where's the fear? Finally, Revelation 6.10, they cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Those who had been killed because of their faith who were under the altar in this vision, cried out to God, how long before you avenge us? Well, the mercy of God is such that people have free will, and they use that free will sometimes to do really terrible things. But his point is that they may come to forgiveness, that they may come to repentance. And that's where we all need to go. All of us have need of repentance. We all have need of forgiveness of sins. These perhaps have lost their patience after quite a bit of suffering, and I, I don't blame them. I don't complain. I won't try to put myself in their shoes. But I will say it tells us God does have a lot of patience for people, but you've got to repent. <clears throat> if today you are not a Christian, become a Christian, a child of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you ready to make him first in your life? We stand ready to help you to obey the gospel. You can be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. 
We will get to water and get you dumped, as was mentioned earlier. Where you bury the old person and come back as a new person, a creature created in Christ Jesus for good works. Are you a Christian who has not walked in good works? Repent, make things right. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. As we said before, nobody here has achieved a sinless perfection. We all continue to need the blood of Jesus. We continue to need forgiveness. We're going to help each other with our prayers, not stand in judgment. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let it be known at this time by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. 